Hi, welcome to the Ian Khan Show. This is the Futurist Podcast. And today I've got with me Rebecca Costa. Now, Rebecca is a legend. She's one of the world's most renowned futurists. She's an award winner. She's done so many things. I, it's a long list of things. And we're going to hear it from her today, what the future looks like. What is it that we should do about the future? And what are some of the, some of the trends that are shaping key things around us, whether it's healthcare, it's additive manufacturing, it's, it's space travel. Let's see what the questions are and uh, let's see where the conversation goes. Rebecca, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Excellent. Thanks so much for being part of uh, this conversation. Now, we're doing this as part of our contribution, collective contribution to Aftershock, which is 50 years after Future Shock came out. And Alvin Topfer did an amazing and incredible work by, by, by putting that work out there so many years ago. And it's been 50 years, 50 years since Future Shock came out. And some of the things that, that we're seeing happen today are what Alvin talked about in the past, but many of those things have not happened or are about to happen. We don't know because it's not a clear uh, prediction as such. What has your experience been contributing to Aftershock? Well, when they first approached me and said, you know, it's the 50th anniversary, I actually know Alvin Toffler and uh, am a great fan of his work. I had uh, many opportunities to meet with him in Los Angeles before I published my first book um, because I didn't have confidence uh, in making forecasts. And I wanted to know um, what gave him the confidence to go public with his forecasts. And he was very generous and kind and, and, uh, and, and to this day makes uh, incredibly accurate uh, predictions. But we have to understand that our ability to predict uh, future outcomes and future events, future sciences and technologies has really grown leaps and bounds over the last 50 years, thanks to artificial intelligence and predictive analytics. Uh, we've generated so much data, you know, uh, uh, I mean, we're generating data at a faster rate than any other time in human history. And when you think about all of that data, uh, it's now possible to go into these massive data sets and look for patterns and trends that we never saw coming. And these patterns and trends happen to be composed of millions and millions of data points. And so they're, every day, our ability to predict what is going to happen in the future is becoming much more precise to the point where when I say this, it's, it's sort of disturbing to people, but it is factual that we will know what is going to happen next with 100% accuracy, not 99%, not a maybe. And the example that I use, I use two examples which people can really relate to. One example is, is that just a couple of decades ago, we didn't know if a woman was gonna give birth to a boy or a girl. Um, uh, uh, there were some people in Asia that could look at the shape of the mother's belly and, and you know, uh, what kind of foods that she was craving. And, and I, allegedly they could predict with fairly good accuracy. But today, when you think about it, a couple of, in, within a couple of decades, we are 100% accurate over an event which has not occurred. The birth has not occurred, but we know if it's a male or a female. Yeah. And we know if it has any congenital defects that can be uh, uh, repaired in the womb. Uh, so that's one example of how quickly we've moved to 100% accuracy. One of the examples that I frequently use that shocks people is that we can now predict with about an 85 to 90% accuracy that a person is going to trip and fall within the next three weeks. And people look at me and say, That's, that can't possibly be. Well, yes, because of all the data we've collected, we now recognize that your normal walking gait will change anywhere from three to five centimeters. And that has, is the precursor to you tripping and falling. That event occurs prior to. And so as we start to nail these things down, we can be very prophylactic. We can get out ahead of them and, and we can prevent them. For example, for the elderly, if they trip and fall, they frequently lose their ability to li li live independently. They break a hip or a knee and yes. they have to go into assisted living. But imagine a Fitbit type of device on your ankle that would indicate that your walking gait has changed 
and that you need to stay off of uneven surfaces, don't take the stairs, get in to see your physical therapist. Imagine that your, that your caretaker's phones are pinged and they say, hey, the person's within 90% in danger of tripping and falling. So we can take measures to prevent disasters in the same way that genetic testing today is becoming more and more accurate at being able to identify diseases that you don't yet have, but have a very high propensity to get. So we're quickly, there, there's a sea change occurring when we talk about the future. The future used to be unknown or at best a good guess, but we're quickly moving away from that to the future being absolutely knowable. And we're not really ready as a society to understand what that means when you can head off just about every danger and tragedy. And thank you that you touched upon so many different things. I, I really believe, and I'll try and address them one by one. I do want to talk to you about healthcare and the emergence of healthcare, but I really believe today we live in an era of uh, a lot of distraction. And a lot of people today complain of um, being overworked, being overwhelmed, not having time for themselves, for their families, for their purpose, to do whatever they need to do. And I just feel this, this over onslaught of technology, content, video, uh, entertainment, is uh, it's not overwhelming because it's too much. It's because we haven't figured a way to control ourselves and to figure out what we need from it. So that's literally the first step, I think, in figuring out where the future is going is understanding today and seeing what's happening, like opening up your senses to all of this change that is happening in the world. And I see that. Well, you must remember that this is not unusual. Mm -hmm. This is not only happening to us. This happened to earlier civilizations when the Industrial Revolution came along. People felt overwhelmed at factory yep. automation and thought, oh, my gosh, it's the end of civilization. Um, my first book, The Watchman's Rattle, you know, it, it went to 27 countries and it was a really unexpected dark horse of a success because, you know, who wants to read a book by a sociobiologist? But at that time, I was identifying a pattern, and that pattern is that social progress begins to accelerate and move at a faster and faster and faster pace. Everything starts to pick up speed. And we are quickly overwhelmed because physiological evolution moves at a very, very slow pace. And eventually that gap between the complexity that we create, the social complexity we create, and what our brains can organically handle and manage, that gap becomes too great. And when that gap does get too great, civilizations collapse. Now, by collapse, I don't mean everyone dies. I mean they revert. It's a reversal to yeah. systems and information that our brains were organically designed to handle. So, mm -hmm. for example, uh, you know, even people on Wall Street, they don't know what a credit default swap is. Right. I mean, the financial institutions have invented so many new uh, products that nobody even knows what they are. Nobody knows how money is valued or how gold is valued. And nobody knows why when the U.S. stock market dives, all the other stock markets in the world dive. Nobody can really explain these things because they're much too complicated for our brains. And so increasingly we're relying on computers to supplement what our brains cannot do. Now, we may be the first civilization that makes the transition, but it would not at all surprise me if we experience a unilateral collapse, or uh, what I mean by collapse is reversal to systems that are easier and feel more human-like. And, and the example I used, economic systems, what our brains are designed to understand is barter. Yeah. You and I meet, you have some eggs, I have some carrots, we bicker in the street, and both mm -hmm. of us feel like we got a good deal, and then we trade. Our brains really have evolved to understand that in terms of an economic interaction. And then we can slightly raise above that, where we can understand um, an IRA maybe, or, or uh, how much interest we're making in our checking account. 
But as you start to add layers of complexity, it leaves whatever the human brain can, can, can manage. And I know that I'm right about this because every time I go to meet my financial advisor, I'm headed toward retirement, and every time I sit down with him, I feel stupid. I, I'm very smart. I'm one of the leading futurists in the world, but I sit there and he, he sounds like he's speaking mm -hmm. English, but I have no idea what he's trying to advise me. Yeah. And I always leave with a lot of homework I have to do yeah. on things that I don't really understand. It's, it's honestly, it's the, I, that makes two of us. Every time I speak with my accountant, I just feel I am the dumbest guy in the world and I, I should go a back to school. A lot of us do. Yeah. A lot of us do. It's, it's far too complicated. And yeah. it also makes us very vulnerable. Think of all those people that gave their money to Bernie Madoff. Oh those God. weren't people, those weren't mom and pops who had $10 in the bank. These were people like Steven Spielberg and very wealthy people who had been in the market a very long time. Yeah. And, 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 and they were very vulnerable to Bernie because he could go to them and say, hey, it's too complicated, but look at all these other people that I make 20% on their money. Yeah. And you look yeah. and you go, well, they're not dummies. Well, yeah, in a way, we all are dummies. All of Absolutely. us, even smart people are dumb <laughs> in a society that's this complex. I love it. Yes, and that's the truth of it, whether anybody likes it or not. I, I want to ask you about something that I did not find in your article, and I know it's very uh, relevant. You know, based on what you're just telling me now that, hey, it's, uh, and I want to quote you first. Uh, in the book, it says, once you've strung a thousand data points together, you'll find the thousand and first isn't difficult to identify, nor is what's likely to follow. And as you said, uh, the ability of information um, to tell us where we're going and to predict things has become so much more easier. Now, with that ease and with the availability of technology are a lot of good things that we can use to change our lives but there are also negative consequences. For example, cyber criminals are becoming more clever day by day and coming out with schemes where you don't even know somebody is scamming you. And this is happening every single day. I'm getting calls on my phone from people who are trying to sell me duck cleaning to the Canada Revenue Agency, everybody, and it's all spam calls, it's all fake calls. Now I know it because I know it, but there's so many other people out there who don't know they're being scammed. What's your take on this emergence of a new way where criminals are operating in the future? Any time a new technology is introduced, we like to fantasize there's no dark side. I don't know why we do this because historically, any time we've had a breakthrough in technology, it has, it has a dark side to it. And the example that I use is, is Charles Lindbergh when he flew across the Atlantic Ocean he was the recipient of many peace prizes because it was believed that if you shuttled uh, diplomats from one country to another using planes, that it would broker more peace. Nobody, and I mean nobody, was imagining we would use those airplanes to deliver bombs yeah. across yeah. the ocean, right? And it's the same thing on the internet. When the internet came about, we went, oh, this is going to be very convenient. It will... It, you know, people won't have to drive everywhere. They can comparison shop. They can, they can stay in touch with their family and their relatives. And we were looking at all the rosy picture. We weren't thinking about identity theft and cyber warfare. But, you know, no, nobody was thinking about kids glued to video games 10 hours a day. We were not thinking about that. Every time we introduce a technology, we delude ourselves into thinking, it's really wonderful. It proliferates really fast. And then it seems like we're running afterwards to deal with the damage after the fact. And I would argue we don't need to do that because we know what technologies are coming. I'm not a Pollyanna type of futurist. Every time I see 3D printing, I go, oh, 3D printing is going to be wonderful. You can 3D print your clothes. You can, you'll be able to 3D print your pharmaceuticals at home. So a bunch of sick people don't all have to meet at the pharmacy and get each other's diseases. I mean, there's, there's going to be wonderful things that come out of 3D. But you'll also be able to 3D print a plastic gun. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and how are we going to stop people from doing that? Yeah. Today, as you and I are talking, you can download a blueprint 
And if you have a $800 3D printer, you can print a plastic gun that will shoot a bullet and kill someone. Yeah. And so we're always behind. Instead of Congress and, and the White House getting out in front of technology, which is what they should do, they should say, hey, there's this new technology. It's beginning to proliferate, 3D printing. What's the downside? Let's get on top of that now. Let's have those difficult conversations. Even if we don't know what to do about them, the beginning of what to do about them is to start the conversation instead of trying to deal with the damage after yeah. it has occurred. So my answer to you is anytime there's a new technology of any type, whether it's the internet or whether it's flying across the Atlantic Ocean, it doesn't matter. There is a downside and real government leadership would get on top of that and get ahead of it. What we, what we need from leadership is to start thinking about acting before the fact, not after the fact. Correct. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And a very simple example I, I, I always give people of how behind we are or how fast we need to learn to catch up is GDPR, the General Data Protection Act that was released in, the, in Europe last year or the year before. And this should have happened 10 years ago when we started using email and started collecting people's email addresses and so on. But we're just 10 years behind in regulation. And the challenge right now is that technology is evolving a little bit faster than it was 25 or 30 years ago. And we need to start planning those steps now about the next five years, the next 10 years. And I think that's the biggest challenge. It's not how much capital can you put on an initiative and how many smaller uh, startups can you uh, spin up who will create a new product. It's about what about the regulations? What about creating a pathway to have a sustainable, safe development of all these technologies? And yes, I but uh, the problem is we're, we're very mm -hmm. reactive and the faster technology begins to move, the more behind we get and the more of a reactive society we are. And the problem yeah. is, of course, it costs a lot more money to fix a problem after it's occurred. And sometimes you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some problems like climate change, as an example, where there comes a point where no amount of human effort can reverse or affect the problem. And we don't like to think that. We're, we're optimists by nature, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we, we always think there's a chance. There's a, there's a last inning save in every baseball game. Somebody's going to come through for you. And, yeah. and, we, and this is why we love the Marvel comic movies. You know, just yeah. when you think there's no hope, you know, the, the hero jumps in and, and does something spectacular. And it seems as though we're increasingly waiting for that last minute save when in fact scientists know there are points at which there is no solution, right? And it, and it will get very, very bad. The coronavirus was an example, an early warning of yeah. what the, but we've had earlier warnings. We had yeah. the avian flu. We've had, we've had many, many warnings that these viruses can move very quickly and they have to be shut down in a, in a rather radical way that people are not comfortable with. And this yep, is where I think our regulators have to get more educated in science and technology. We need more scientists and technologies in, in, in leadership. Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, nine, year, uh, ten, nine years ago uh, today, um, a, a movie came out called um, uh, uh, Contagion with Matt Damon in it. And it just exactly was what's happening with the coronavirus, right? How many, uh, how many warnings do we get? Correct. And I, I don't know the answer to when our reactive nature will change to be proactive. I don't know, but I'm hoping it does. I, I, I know we're short on time today, uh, and I want to ask you a couple of different questions on some of the industries or some of the innovative positive sides of technology that are evolving and your thoughts on it. Uh, in your contribution to the book as well, you've written about nanomedicine, nanotechnology, and uh, automation. Tell us a little bit about nanomedicine. What's the future of medicine and coronavirus being something that's out there right now? But generally, do, will people live longer in the future because technology will help them live longer somehow? 
Well, they won't live longer uh, necessarily. It sort of depends on the direction society takes, but they, have, they will have the potential to live longer. Well, let me put it that way. Um, for people who are not familiar with nanomedicine, uh, even today, we have reduced ro robots down to the size of a human cell. So we're familiar with the big robots because uh, we see them in movies and, and we see them uh, potentially delivering mail in large corporations and, and doing rather routine tasks. But what we're not familiar with is the miniaturization of robots. And as they get down to the size of a human cell, we're going to abandon this idea that we have to cut you open and remove organs to make you well or that we have to douse your entire body with poisons to kill off um, antagonistic cells. Yeah. These, ro these robots will be injected into you with a simple syringe, just like you're taking a shot, and they'll be programmed to remove cancers, to remove the plaque that leads to Alzheimer's, to, rem to, to look for any problematic cells in your body, and you will simply uh, eliminate them in your urine or, or other. So it's, uh, we're going to be treating the body from the inside out. We're not going to be taking things out. I'm going to tell you that a, a couple hundred years from now, this idea that we cut you open and removed an organ to yeah. fix you is going to look like bloodletting, which, yeah. by the way, if people don't know, we practiced bloodletting for 200 years, even though the patients were dying. Yeah, we, wow. we, we didn't let that get in our way. We we're still draining the blood out of people. Yeah. And, yeah. and what we're doing today is going to look extremely wow. savage. Already in agriculture, they are now, instead of using pesticides, they are experimenting with, with, um, with spraying the plants with nanobots that the plant then ingests. And then the, the nanobot is communicating with watering devices outside mm -hmm. and saying, oh, I don't need any water today, or mm -hmm. I, I'm deficient a certain type of nutrition. Imagine yeah. what this will do for nutrition. Yeah, I mean, from absolutely. inside the body, we could communicate, hey, you know, I'm very low on zinc. I'm having uh, problems with my, my mental impairment, or I'm, yeah. I'm very low on vitamin C, or I'm very vulnerable. Uh, you know, I'm not getting enough of, enough protein in my body. You know, your watch, your your Fitbit watch will eventually be talking to something inside your body that yep. will be letting you know what foods you need to get up to exercise, whether you've gained even an ounce of weight, um, yep. what your body fat mass is. All of that will be communicated inside your body in real time. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that over, you know, the last... 5,000 years of human history, uh, we've, we've, the, the, the average lifespan has, has really gone up from being 25 or 30 years in the Egyptian civilization to now being 70 or 80 in developed societies is, is great. So I, I personally see this as an opportunity for us to potentially have um, a, a much healthier life generally because now we can take care of ourselves in a different way. Um, I also well, Ray ask, Kurzweil says we'll be able to download our consciousness, our memories, our thoughts uh, into a computer and we will have uh, life forever. That the oh, real right. problem is this biological uh, spacesuit that we're trapped in and yeah. the fact that it degrades and it fails and eventually we die. If you yeah. can remove human consciousness from the biological spacesuit, then you have mm -hmm. life forevermore uh, yeah. in the terms of an avatar. Um, I don't think we're anywhere close to that. We know very mm -hmm. little about how the brain functions. In fact, it's, yeah. it's very sad how, how little we know, considering it's the, it's the you know, uh, controlling yeah. uh, uh, organ of our body. But, but uh, you know, we're, we're not there. Now, uh, Ray thinks we're closer. <laughs> and yeah. he, may, he may know things I don't know, and I wouldn't put it past him. Absolutely. I know we're heading uh, towards the end of our uh, session as well. I want to ask you about the future of work. You've, you've written about automation um, and how by 2030, 2040, more work will be performed by automation, by technology. Uh, wh what do you think about what we as people or as humans will end up doing um, as our purpose on this planet? Well, 
Many, many years ago, I got to have this conversation with the great naturalist, uh, Edward O. Wilson, uh, out of Harvard University. And I was, I was really excited about some new technologies and sciences. And I was, you know, I get very agitated and excited and I was telling him all about it. And he was very kind and, and being a naturalist, he looked at me and he said, but you know, he said, one day, if space aliens were to land, you know, and we were, or we were to discover them and develop a, a conversation, he said, they wouldn't be very interested in our mathematics or our science or our technology, because presumably, as we get further and further out in space, it turns out that science and math is the same. It's rather stable. Everywhere we go, it's the same. <laughs> Physics remains consistent in outer space. And so he said, what they would be really interested in, though, is the things that make us human and unique in the universe. And that would be our art, our music. Uh, he goes, presumably those wouldn't be replicated by other life forms. He said, but their science would look remarkably similar. Yeah. And it really was a startling awareness to me that what makes us unique in the entire you know, outer space universe is really the things that make us human. And those things are very different from science and technology. So as much as a, a technologist I am, it really gave me a far greater appreciation for the arts. I think people will turn to the arts and to creativity and we'll see a resurgence of music and painting and other art forms that have not been invented yet. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing your insights. Where can our viewers find more information about you and your incredible work? Well, thank you for having me. They can go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's R-E-B-E-C-C-A-C-O-S-T-A.com. And there's a lot of videos and, and they should sign up for our newsletter because we're constantly putting out new information about emerging technologies in the newsletter. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be a uh, co-collaborator with you on Aftershock and whoever, if you haven't, um, the folks, if you haven't read Aftershock or haven't purchased it yet, buy it. It's, uh, I don't know how much it costs. It's, it's very nominal, but please buy it. It's got insights, an article by Rebecca in there and uh, a total of 50 different futurists from across the world who are sharing their insights. Uh, Rebecca Costa, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll catch you another time and keep inspiring people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey friend, this is Ian Khan. If you liked what you saw on my video, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh, updated, and ready for the future. For more information, also visit my website at iankhan.com.